So the challenges for monetary policy include populism in politics. They include uh, the new concerns about financial stability and all that entails. I'm going to talk mostly about a, a somewhat narrow but still very important constraint, which is the one that Olivier uh, brought up, which is the low level of nominal interest rates and the constraints that poses for ordinary monetary policy. My paper, uh, which is somewhat encyclopedic, uh, I guess like Olivier and, and Larry, uh, has three main sections. Uh, and I'll maybe obviously only to hit the highlights. The first section is about unconventional policy tools. Uh, the second section of my remarks is about alternative policy frameworks, other ways of changing the framework of monetary policy to make it more potent, to give it more scope for action, even in a world of low interest rates. And then the third one is the question of central bank independence in the modern world. So let me talk just a little bit about each of these three sections, starting with policy tools going beyond the management of the short-term interest rate. If you can't cut short-term rates down enough, if you can't reduce them enough, then a substitute policy is to promise to keep them low for a long time. So duration can substitute for the magnitude of the cut. And that's, that's a theme that keeps coming up uh, in, the, in the analytical literature. It comes up in some of these tools which I'm talking about. So to begin with forward guidance, for example, Delphic forward guidance is guidance that just basically a forecast. Here's what the central bank think is going to happen. Think about the Fed's dots. Here's what we think the economy is going to do. Here's what we think policy is going to do. The idea of Odyssean guidance is to make a commitment or a near commitment, which may be contingent, about what policy will be in the future. And so there have been a number of examples of this. The Fed used thresholds for uh, its rate policy in the recent recovery, where we said we were not going to raise rates at least until unemployment inflation met certain criteria. Despite the fact that forward guidance has been developed to a significant extent on the fly and in an ad hoc way, it has been effective and the literature suggests that it has affected uh, both uh, market rates and uh, forecasters' expectations of how the economy will evolve. In the future, forward guidance will be used quite regularly and I think effectively as we learn better how to commit the uh, to future policy actions. The other tool, quantitative easing, I want to talk about, uh, also has, I, I just want to start by saying that it also has this forward uh, commitment element to it. Many have theorists, have very good theorists, have argued that quantitative easing is just basically an asset swap and it's not really going to change the, uh, the set of opportunities that investors have. Uh, but Joe Gagnon here at the Peterson did a survey, looked at a large number of studies, and I think there's very strong evidence that QE is effective, and I believe that it works both through the signaling and to the, uh, through the uh, portfolio balance effects, and so it does represent an additional tool. I, I spend a lot of time at the other side of the critique of QE is, well, maybe it does something, but it's got all kinds of terrible side effects. And so they've begun with a hierarchy of why, why it's bad. So it's going to create hyperinflation. No, nope, no, nope, that didn't work. It's going to crash the dollar and cause a currency war. No, nope. it's going to create a boom and a bust in the stock market. No, nope. and down, down the list. You know, I, I try to talk about some of these. Uh, the distributional one in particular, I find very, very unconvincing. First, substantively, I, I don't think that QE arguably does worsen distribution. Uh, it raises stock prices. That's true. It's supposed to do that. But it also, um, uh, helps debtors versus creditors. It helps mortgage uh, borrowers refinance at lower rates. It increases house prices, which 60, we have a 60% plus home ownership rate. And, and most importantly, uh, it helps create jobs, which is the most important uh, criteria, I think. There are some issues to be raised about QE, the uncertainty about its effects, uh, the fact it does have some fiscal implications, although I argue that most of the time they're going to be positive rather than negative, but nevertheless, they do have, there is a, a governance issue involved with fiscal. The signaling aspects are, are hard to manage. On the tools issue, I think I'm pretty much on board with sort of the sequencing that you know, Janet Yellen has talked about, which is that when, uh, when the next recession comes, the first line of defense will be to cut short-term interest rates, forward guidance will come into play very quickly, only if it's a relatively serious downturn, and importantly, if we can't get any help from the fiscal authorities, will QE come into play. But if it does have to come into play, it will probably be constructive. Now, all that being said, I think I might disagree a bit with Janet in arguing that, that this will be enough in all circumstances. I think it clearly won't be enough, at least in the most severe downturns. So then the question is, and this is the second part of the paper, is there a way to change the framework of monetary policy 
that will make monetary policy more effective uh, despite the fact that nominal interest rates are quite low. The two existing proposals that I talk about a bit are raising the inflation target and adopting a so-called price level target. Now, the, the idea of a higher inflation target is, I think, familiar. Uh, it's, it's a very straightforward proposal. If you raise the inflation target from, say, 2% to, it'd have to be at least 3 or 4, I, I would say maybe 4 to have any real benefit. I come down opposing this idea uh, for at least three reasons. One is, I think that given that where we're starting from at 2% inflation with 2% uh, well-anchored expectations, Getting from two to four will be quite difficult. There are also some real costs of inflation. We don't understand them all that well. I suspect that if, if the Fed announced a 4% inflation target, there would be a very strong political pushback, uh, which would uh, probably, at a minimum, would make the, the, the Fed's announcement less credible in terms of its sustainability. Inflation targeting is a very inefficient response to the problem of low nominal interest rates. What we know, and here coming back to the theme of lower for longer, we know the optimal response to the zero lower bound is essentially this promise that when you hit the zero lower bound, that you'll keep rates lower for longer, or you'll make up, have a makeup policy to compensate for the fact that you can't go any lower in the current short term rate. All right, and that in turn implies that at, on the exit from the zero lower bound, you will have a transitory increase in inflation. A better approach, and this is the second uh, proposal, I, and I, I think it's strictly better, is the price level target idea, which has been talked about uh, the recent ECB paper, uh, Lars Svensson has been an advocate, others. Instead of targeting the current inflation rate, you, you draw a trend line at 2% and you basically try to hit that price level over time. The difference with a price level target and inflation target is how you deal with a transitory shock. So if you have a transitory shock to inflation, an inflation targeter just ignores it and it just brings inflation back to target over time. A price level targeter, though, will want to undo, you know, undo the, um, the shock. So if you have a positive inflation shock, then the price level targeters want to have a period of inflation below target in order to get price level back to the trend line. If you're at the zero lower bound and you have a period of very low inflation, so as last, in the last eight or nine years, inflation has been consistently below the Fed's target, so what the PLT, price level targeting approach, would suggest is that you should be um, following that with a period of overshoot. And that means in turn that you're promising to keep rates lower for longer. That's exactly what the optimal policy says. There are, however, two disadvantages to um, the price level targeting thing. The first is that, as Olivier mentioned, you also have to have this, this offsetting policy away from zero lower bound. So if you have a big oil price shock, uh, when you're away from zero lower bound, you've got to offset that, which means tightening very strongly to get inflation below target to offset that, that shock. That's a problem. The other problem is that I think it's be hard. It's a big change in framework, and I, I put some cost on that. If we can stay within our something like our current framework, that would be it would save a lot of complexity and confusion about changing the way we communicate. I look at what I call a temporary price level target. When you're away from zero lower bound, it's, it's business as usual. Ordinary inflation targeting, 2% in target, nothing different. But what you say in advance when you adopt this framework is you say, well, next time we hit the ZOB, we're going to care not only about inflation itself, but the cumulative inflation rate over the entire ZOB period. So we're going to be saying today, for example, we would look back over the period back to 2008 and say inflation uh, since 2008, when we hit zero, is averaged only one, one and a half percent. And in this new framework, which I'm talking about, which I, I want to emphasize is not a comment in any way on current Fed policy because they don't have that framework. But if they did, then they would be saying, well, let's, let's have higher than 2% inflation for a while to get that average back to 2%. This is not about moving inflation expectations. This is about telling bond markets that when you're in the ZOB and inflation is below target, we're going to keep rates lower for longer. So what that's going to do is cause long-term rates to fall and your average person thinking about buying a house is going to say, well, I don't know anything about the Fed. I don't care about their inflation target, but I see that mortgage rates are really low, so I'm going to buy a house. So it would have effects even if inflation expectations don't really move in the general public. Although I've explained it to you in terms of price level targeting, it could be explained to the public totally in terms of inflation targeting. We're at 2% inflation targeter, and the only change is that in a ZOB period, we're going to be looking at the inflation target over the entire 
over the entire period and trying to make sure that the average inflation rate during this period where we're constrained is at 2%. And so it, it also doesn't affect long-run inflation averages either. The basic insight that I'd like to leave you with is that both between the tools and the frameworks, the, the best hope, I think, uh, is to have a mechanism by which markets come to expect that the central bank will be very slow about raising rates away from the ZLB. And that in turn will, if that's anticipated, that will in turn uh, reduce the incidence of the ZOB and maybe mean in the end that ZOB episodes are not even as long as they otherwise might be. The traditional argument for what I'll call CBI, central bank independence, is the so-called inflation bias and the idea that politicians left on their own uh, will uh, be too short-sighted and they will push the economy beyond full employment. That would create inflation. So you need independent, more hawkishly minded uh, central bankers to avoid that bias. And so now that argument doesn't look so good right now because uh, as pointed out, that first of all, inflation is too low, not too high. And secondly, the politicians in US and Germany and elsewhere are, are actually more hawkish than the central bankers rather than more dovish. So what, what, what gives? And moreover, I would just add that uh, you have smart people like Gaudi Eggerson saying, well, if you have deflation risk rather than an inflation risk, that means fiscal and monetary policy need to coordinate for helicopter money or some other similar purpose in order to get inflation expectations up. So what I try to lay out in the last section of the paper is my, is my case for why central bank independence is actually much broader than that. Obviously, there is, there is a technocratic argument in terms of the market sensitivity, the need for communication, the need for coherence. Uh, consistency. But then there's, I think, another right way to think about the next question is, well, okay, fine, but why not have experts in the Treasury rather than experts in the central bank? Even if um, inflation bias is not the problem, politics is still the problem. To what extent, if the Treasury ran monetary policy, would, would there be a temptation to uh, make an announcement uh, on rates, you know, to, to obscure some political problem that might exist? Uh, would there be um, uh, full credibility of forecasts, for example, if the Treasury were making the, the forecast. The other point, and this is my last point that I'll make, is that the, the arguments I've been making in the rest of the paper that to, to deal with the zero lower bound, you need to have forward-looking credibility. I think that's much harder uh, if the Treasury's running it than if the central bank is running it. Alan Greenspan had worked with seven different Treasury secretaries. I worked with four. There's a lot more turnover, a lot more short-termism. You change from party to party. The institutional continuity is much less in the Treasury. You need an institution that can develop a reputation for, for, for following a certain set of, of not rules in the, in the narrow sense, but uh, consistent policies. And that includes, for example, the ability to introduce something like, uh, like a price level target, for example, or, or forward guidance. So uh, I, talk in the, I, I don't think this is a completely inviolable rule. I think there are circumstances in which uh, the central bank can reasonably work together with other parts of the government, and I talk about that some in the paper. But I think the, the broader case for CBI, central bank independence, goes well beyond the inflation bias.